So again, as a scientist, I thought, well, there are many hypotheses we might have to come up with to explain this. And they're listed there. So we can work through some of these. All right? Gary's chain is hard to pull. I thought, oh, his wife did this for sure to him. But uh, she, she can't get around very well. She could not have gotten in his backyard the, the black iron thing in the, in the yard there with the white on it is the feeding platform. He's got a fence around his yard. Uh, he doesn't have kids. The neighbors don't get along with him real well. And uh, um, I don't think anybody put the, put the things there. It could have been a squirrel, perhaps, or it could have been crows that did that. I also don't think he's pulling my chain, although a lot of people, my chain is easy to pull. And uh, the reason I think this is the case is because I've had lots of other people tell me the same sort of thing. So, for example, in 2005, Nancy calls into a radio show and says, a crow just landed on my lap and dropped a wooden bead off on me. She didn't feed them. Gail calls in and says, I had a red and white rocket dropped on me. <laughs> Leona from Missouri gets glass in her bird feeder. Nice shiny bits of glass are left there after the crows come in and, and feed. Eric in Idaho uh, leaves mice for the magpies that come to his barn, and the magpies leave him a variety of shiny objects on the same barrel where he leaves them mice. And Beth in Seattle, as the diagram here that Tony's drawn shows, uh, got a key one time. She walks along and throws kibble. Some people throw peanuts for the crows. And she hears this tinkle one time and turns around and there's a nice shiny key, maybe to a Porsche, who knows, uh, <laughs> sitting on the, on the road for her to get. So, we've see, so in this case, we saw, she saw the bird leave the, the gift. And we might think that there's a variety of you know, really bizarre things going on here, but it, at least we can rule out the the object of, um, you know, the interest in Gary's story that he talked to the crows and they left it to him. Nobody else had talked to the crows or ravens first, and they still got gifts. So it doesn't have to be that complex. It could also be a mistake. Maybe perhaps these birds came in and they had these gifts. Perhaps they're just things that they picked up, you know, before they came in to feed. And when they saw a kibble, they drop them in their bill, grab the kibble, and go on with the food. I mean, they are, they are crows after all. They'll go after food. And uh, my only question would be, why wouldn't they come back and get it? If they picked it up before, why not come back? And maybe they would have if, if the person hadn't been so stunned as to, to take it first. But I think we can make some predictions that some of these items, if it's just you know, something left by mistake, they should have no relevance to people. And in fact, Gary had some of those kind of items. And anybody should get a gift. And in fact, people like the, the woman who had the crow land on her and drop a bead or a rocket, they didn't have any pr prior interaction with crows. So perhaps uh, there is something here that it's, it's just a mistake. And the, some of the kind of behavior we see is consistent with that. But some of it's not. Uh, and some of it suggests to me that this could even be an adaptive behavior by some crows. Maybe they've learned that this is a way to get people to pay attention and engage them. Maybe this is why we're so fascinated with crows and ravens uh, way back in, the, in our early evolutionary past is that you can imagine if, if a crow or a raven came, came by your camp and dropped a really neat shiny shell or something. Say, Whoa, that's pretty interesting. I'm going to pay attention to that bird from here on out. And it's not totally without precedent in the animal world. They give gifts to each other in courtship, for example. Uh, some of them use uh, shiny objects to, uh, to attract others, like bowerbirds. And dolphins even are known to give fish to birds and to people, uh, perhaps as a reward or uh, encouragement to keep helping them forage. So as weird as it is, it could be uh, adaptive, or it could be a mistake. I can't really sort among those two alternatives at the present time. But it's certainly, I had the same response that all of you did when I first heard it, and that is, this is crazy, this is ridiculous. But it's actually, the more you look and the more you think about some of these weird anecdotes, they might have uh, some real um, validity to them. So let me just end up with saying that as, as interesting as I find these birds, as Leah said, not everybody does find them quite as interesting. And in fact, we tend to uh, get our fill of them rather quickly and get tired of them and take our frustrations and anger uh, uh, out on them rather uh, severely. So for example, in, in, in your 
country, Chatham, Ontario. There have been great sieges upon crows there and, and hundreds of thousands have been killed. Same thing in many places in the U.S. Uh, same thing is happening in Tokyo and Singapore right now. Lots of people, their full-time job is to go out and reduce crow numbers because people are tired of them fouling the streets or perhaps tearing open garbage as they have in Tokyo and other places. So these responses are changing our culture. They've, they've changed the culture of garbage handling in Tokyo into trying to keep garbage now out of the crow's reach. But they've also changed our culture in terms of how we respond to wildlife. And in this case, they've pushed us over the, the edge in that we respond very strongly and negatively to them and we've reduced their populations. And then what often happens is that we've reduced populations so much that now they're rare and interesting again. And in fact, they're now a conservation target and we have to bring them back up, which has happened with the raven in parts of Europe. Their numbers were so lowered by persecution that now they're an endangered species that has to be restored in these parts of, uh, of Europe. So this cycle, I think, of where we have so many of them that they become a nuisance and we, we kill them, basically, to the point where they're so rare that they're interesting and engaging that we conserve them is just a continual uh, part of the same cycle, part of the same loop. And sometimes, at least with respect to crows and ravens, we're, we're very far over the edge of that loop to the point where we've caused species to go extinct. Uh, locally here, the... The, um, the diagram that Tony's drawn here is of the northwestern crow, which was our local special species that lived in the tide pools and beaches of, uh, from basically Puget Sound, maybe uh, southern Washington on up through the coast of Alaska. Now I would argue that species is extinct. It's been genetically swamped by interbreeding with the American crow, which is fascinating as it is, is a bird that has spread because of our change in the landscape. Going back to the first slide I showed you, our urbanization of the world has allowed that bird to spread from the east of uh, the U.S. especially up north into Canada and also uh, west across the U.S. in, in the plain states where, where it could survive uh, on our new urbanized landscapes. And its numbers have increased to the point where the separation that once occurred between that species and our northwestern species has, has failed and they now interbreed regularly, and I would argue there's probably no genetically unique animal as the northwestern crow anymore here. Maybe in the Queen Charlotte Islands, maybe there are some places uh, here in uh, the wilder parts of, of D.C. where this species still survives in pure genetic form, but nobody has been able to find it or, or really have, has even looked for it yet. And in Hawaii, the four animals that are shown here, our American crow is on top for size for you. And then you've got uh, below that the Hawaiian crow. Have any of you all ever seen a Hawaiian crow in the wild? One person, a couple. Uh, you cannot see them in the wild anymore. They're only found in captivity now. They're, they're extinct in the wild. And there's about 60 or 70 individuals left. The two lower birds are Hawaiian crows or ravens that are extinct. They were extinguished shortly after Polynesians first colonized the islands. So by either purpose or just bad luck, the way we've changed the environment in some cases has led to increases in crows that have perhaps swamped out others, and it's directly reduced others. Uh, and because of that, the overall diversity of crows and ravens has been reflected or been reduced, I should say, and changed by our activities. So even an animal that's as common as a crow that you think of as being everywhere and can survive anything, it's not always the case. There are some of them that are quite sensitive to our activities. So with that, I would thank you for your attention. I will hope that you see 12 crows, if, if you can see from the lights that there are 12 of them up there. Uh, that's a sign of good luck, if you see 12 crows. If you see a lot of them, count to 12 and just leave it at that, and I think you'll still be all right. Thanks very much.